Season one of X-Men 97 has come to a close. I wasn't able to cover the show week to week, but I still had a lot of thoughts on the individual episodes. So today I'm gonna stop and rank all 10 episodes of X-Men 97 from the worst to the best. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Share your ranking of the episodes of X-Men 97, or at least what were some of your favorite episodes, and what were some of the ones that didn't work as well for you. By the nature of a video like this, it will be a spoiler-packed video, so if you haven't finished the season yet, probably not the best video for you to watch. Finish the season, then come join the conversation over here. Real quick, as a point of reference, I grew grew up watching the original X-Men animated series. I was the perfect age for it. I was in the fifth grade. So it's one of the things that made me love the X-Men. I went out and bought the toys, the trading cards, all of that fun stuff. So when they announced they were doing this revival series, I thought that was awesome. I'm the perfect person for that to be a nostalgia project for me. With all of that said, let's get started. In last place, episode four, Montendo, as well as Life, Death, Part one. And simply put, the Jubilee side of it was just a little bit too goofy for me, and the Storm Forge plotline didn't really connect with me all that well. I just found it pretty dull. Um, and any time it cut away to what they were doing throughout these episodes, I just wasn't that interested into in it. So with Jubilee, have this whole plotline pulled into a video game, and it just it's the sort of thing that just feels more trivial and, and goofy than the rest of the season. In particular, where you're like killing off main characters, having genocide in Genosha, and then we spend half of an episode with Jubilee in a video game. It, it just, tonally, it feels different. It feels like it's in a different X-Men show. And I imagine you're when they're developing the season, they don't want everything to just be heavy. They don't want everything to just be one thing. And so then you have horror episodes, you have action episodes, you have the big story arcs, you have character stuff, and then like, let's do the fun thing in the middle of it with the video game. That was my least favorite thing that they did in the season. I was like, ah, that, that one's not for me. And then, like I said, with the, all of the Storm and Forge stuff was, it just felt like it slowed down because it's just a lot of them talking and him confessing things and her pondering her worth and relevance if she doesn't have her powers in. I don't know. It wasn't for me. Or the way they packaged it in the context with them so far detached from everything else, that I just didn't... It just felt like we're cutting away from everything that matters to go to this small thing over here. Number nine, episode six, Life, Death, Part Two. And this one kind of falls very much kind of into the same category as the last one for kind of similar reasons. Half of it is Storm Forge stuff as she's working through her power issues and this demon owl and getting her powers back. I just didn't care for it. All the reasons I just said before. The other half of it, it's not the same as the Jubilee in a video game thing, but it's Charles Xavier in space. And when the rest of the season isn't really about that or setting that up, it, it just cuts, cuts so hard to from big tragic events in the last episode. We're like, oh man, wow, look what just happened. This, wow, oh man. And then cut to a whole lot of Charles Xavier working out the details of his engagement to a space queen. <laughs> and, and there's like everything about it, it's building out this whole other world, this whole other conflict, all this stuff at a point in time where we're like, really like I, I, the Genosha stuff, like what, who lived, who died, where, how are they going to respond? Like, I want to, I want to know more about that. That's what I'm really interested in. And instead we're building out all this stuff about Charles Xavier and it just, all of it just felt like pulling me away from the thing that I, I cared about. And we have to give an explanation for where Charles has been, what's causing him to not go back, all of that, like there's value to it, but and as me binging through the show, it just felt like you're pulling me away. Next up, episode three, Fire Made Flesh. This is the first of the horror episodes. And I don't know, it just, the, the overtly horror things weren't quite as interesting to me. 
And I think in the case of this one, it felt too much like there's a an important story here about, wait a minute, Jean Grey just came back, there's a baby, baby gets this virus, has to go to the future. And that that's a lot of story right there, in and of itself. That's so much. And our runtime is spent kind of on haunted house, spooky, scary, Mr. Sinister stuff that, of course, matters in the context of all of this, but it, it made it feel like this really big, gigantic thing about newborn baby, Jean Grey returns, virus, send her to the future, let's see what happens. We're flying through that so that we can do the spooky stuff, and the, the spooky stuff didn't interest me as much as the, the soap opera. The, what, there's two Jean Greys and a baby that's sick? What do we have to give up my baby? All that was great and cool and interesting and setting up a very cool character, but I just didn't care about the horror stuff. Number seven, episode one, to me, my X-Men. Uh, fairly standard, straightforward kickoff episode. Follows the typical formula for X-Men starters going all the way back to X-Men the Animated Series where Jubilee is rescued from the Sentinels, brought in, and then in X-Men the movie, movie, Rogue is attacked by Sabretooth and the X-Men save her and pull her to the mansion. And then in our, our episode here, we've got Roberto. He's attacked, he's rescued, and he becomes our point of view character kind of going into the X-Men. And um, you know, we, we get in kind of fairly... Some of the more familiar aspects of the season for me, because some of it because of the structure they used to to go in, but then also Master Mold, Sentinels, what's kind of going on here. So it's, it's good, it's solid, um, but just a little bit familiar. And then ending on the high note with, wait a minute, Charles left the X-Men to Magneto? What's going on? Number six, episode two, Mutant Liberation Begins. And this was where I think the show really started to show how it was going to get interesting and cool, where you have the X-Men being led by their greatest enemy, Magneto, who clearly feels a loyalty to his friend and like he needs to honor his wishes. And there's something very captivating about that. But all the complexities of Magneto is still a villain to the rest of the world and to the X-Men. And so he has to earn their trust. He has to earn the, the you know, the, what the UN's trust. And so you kind of have this whole story play out where you, like we're only in episode two and we're doing wild, crazy stuff. We're having Storm lose her powers and, um, you know, all everything that kind of goes down in the finale with Magneto showing his powers, but also not destroying everyone that stands in his way, trying to be a little bit more like what Charles would have wanted him to be. This is where the show kicked in for me. Today's video is sponsored by BetterHelp. If you don't know my story, when I started this YouTube channel, I was unemployed and in an addiction rehab program. My previous career put a lot of stress on me. I bottled it up and then I turned to alcohol as my coping mechanism and then my coping mechanism turned into an addiction. Therapy is a safe place to get things off your chest and go figure out how to work through whatever's weighing you down. If I'd gone to therapy sooner, I could have learned how to set boundaries and avoid so much of the stress that pushed me to alcohol. I could have learned better coping mechanisms so I wouldn't have needed alcohol, and I could have avoided so much pain for myself and for those around me. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Sean Chandler today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp H-E-L-P dot com slash Sean Chandler. In fifth episode seven, Bright Eyes. And this is the proper follow-up to Genosha being destroyed and where we really get to see the aftermath of all of that. Rogue, devastated by the death of Gambit, basically goes on a revenge streak trying to track down anyone that can tell her who's responsible for all of this. Along the way, we get her even interacting with Captain America, 
fun little detail and the sort of thing where they're able to have a lived in universe where if these events happened and the rest of the Marvel universe are there, they would have an opinion on it. They would be doing something about it. And so you just get a little glimpse, glimpse of that. You see a little taste of it through Rogue's revenge quest. You have Roberto and Jubilee kind of going to his family and the even the way they kind of play that interaction with his parents to where they they accept him as a mutant they just don't accept it publicly like they on a personal level cool you're you're our son that's fine but as the legacy of their family name and everything that comes along with that we're going to hide it and tying into you know so many of the the different you know themes and making it personal not just the big war but like what does it look like for him on a day-to-day basis and in the midst of everything going on his parents are like well, of course we love you i mean we can't tell anyone about you but we love you of course we accept you in our house not out there and so i th- thought it had the the stakes it had emotion and it kept it personal. Number four, episode nine, Tolerance is Extinction, part two. So we had a three-part finale, great, big, epic conclusion to the season. All the parts are really great. Uh, uh, Part two is probably my least favorite of the three, uh, simply because it's all all war, where the other ones have a, a little bit more of kind of the strategizing the final payoff, the resolution. This one's that middle piece that's all in, all action. And so obviously top four on here, so really enjoyed it. So I don't say that as a negative, but that's kind of why I have it a little bit lower um, is, is simply because it is just all action. But when it comes to the action, we're using e- each character's personal connection to everything going on as well as their power set determines their part in all of this and everyone has a part to play in what we're trying to do to stop everything taking place we're um having a battle on multiple levels where there's multiple things we have to do so it feels layered and complex and then we get an ending that is pretty shocking in getting that classic image of the metal being ripped out of Wolverine right off of his bones. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to join me down below in the comment section. What did you think about the show? What's your ranking of the episodes? Just like, what's your favorite? What's your least favorite? All that fun stuff. I have talked about the X-Men before. You can check out my ranking of the movies right over there. In third, episode five, remember it, the destruction of Genosha. The first half has celebration. It has all sorts of character moments as Jean, Madeline are kind of working through their whole mental situation. And then you get this horrible event that kicks off the whole back end of the season where the ultimate villain plan comes into play and Genosha is destroyed. Right before it goes down, we get a little bit of Cable showing up. You get a little bit of that fun character moment of the realization of the mother seeing her son Uh, And then utter devastation as thousands of people die. And on that most personal level, you have Gambit who gets uh, an awesome, excellent, epic, sacrificial death uh, in killing Master Mold. So, yeah, just a really cool episode. Also devastating. And one where you go, see, Marvel says you can go for it. You, You can, like actually commit to going dark. Our runner-up, episode eight, Tolerance is Extinction, part one, where our big culmination of everything finally starts to unfold. We realize who our main villain truly is, what is driving his actions, and it, it, it it's action-packed. It gets weird and crazy with these zombie human sentinel things appearing all over the world. The stakes are truly global. You have moments in here where someone who was against Magneto turns to his side, like, turns. Like, this is crazy as that, like, the craziest in all of this, Magneto is right. Let's Magneto go. The whole world goes into blackout. Like, dire, massive consequences taking place uh, in the story. 
And so just like an episode that just, it, it's an example of how big a story truly can be, even in just an episode of television. But coming in at number one for me will be episode 10, Tolerance's Extinction Part 3. And I just felt like they, they ended on a high note where you have this final resolution, this final conflict, and to be able to overcome everything, defeat our enemy, stop this ship from crashing into the earth, every character matters, they have their part to play in what's happening, but you also have to, the interpersonal conflicts matter, where for all of this to work, to stop catastrophe, Charles has to restore his friendship with Eric. And he needs to remind Eric who he is and bring him back and find the, the glimmer of humanity in him that can also the remains of the friendship. And you put that at the center of it. So there's that emotional arc to it with the epic battles, the stakes. And then even beyond that, once again, it feels like a populated earth where it keeps cutting to New York City. Like, yeah, that's Doctor Strange. Hey, that's Daredevil. And not relying on that, not putting the show on its shoulders, but making that just be a little treat, like a little fun thing for the fans that's thrown in there, done the right way. Um, and so just like found a way to pull all this together and give us a resolution that had action, but also had emotion tied into the bigger ideas being explored and gave us that one, you know, final gigantic twist at the end of like, oh crap, what happened to our X-Men? And then tying it to, to, of course, one of the most iconic classic villains, Apocalypse. So uh, I just thought it was a great finale. So it comes in at number one. Remember to join me down below in the comment section to share your thoughts on the show. Check out my X-Men movie ranking right over there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much.